I'm about to play two different guitar recordings for you, and I want you to answer the question, which one sounds better, A or B? Here we go. Okay, which one was better? A, the gold one, or B, the green one? The correct answer is B, the green one. Now, can you say specifically why the green one is better? There's one specific answer I'm looking for. By the way, do you have a copy of this already? This is my ultimate recording checklist. This will help you get unstuck when you're in the studio recording something you can't think of what to record next. This gives you a bunch of questions to ask yourself. It's a single page. Print this out. Keep it next to your desk. Use it on your next recording session. You can have it for free. Just go to homestudiocorner.com slash checklist. So what was the difference between the two guitar parts? Timing. The only difference between the two, part A was out of time and sloppy, part B was in time and felt a lot better. Nothing else was different about the two. Let's take a quick listen again. Like, it makes the drums sound out of time. It's so out of time. But the drums are locked to the grid. That's how bad the guitar was compared to this one. That one makes me want to make a stank face and bob my head. This one makes me want to smash my head into something. I can't tell you how hard it was to record that. It took me a long time. <laughs> Good habits die hard, I guess. Let's talk for a second about why timing matters. And no, before you get your panties in a bunch, I'm not talking about we need to put everything completely locked to the grid and remove all humanity from our music. That's not the point. What I'm talking about is groove. The options are it grooves or it doesn't. Groovy, stank face, doesn't, not stank face. We don't want it to be sloppy and gross. We want it to groove. But there's a bigger reason why I'm such a proponent and stickler for things being in time. And here it is. Are you ready? Your mix will sound muddy if your tracks are out of time. No matter what you do in the mix, it will sound muddy until you fix the timing problem. What's that all about? Well, it's kind of physics. It's kind of... Math. Think through it with me. If everybody hits at the same time, so we're thinking we're moving in time and everybody hits right here. Kick drum, snare drum, your guitar part, bass. If they all hit together, then our ears are hearing all of these frequencies at one time and it goes and it feels great. What if everybody hits at slightly different times? So let's say kick and snare are still right in the middle doing great, but let's say your guitar comes in early, and then let's say maybe the bass comes in late. Now, those frequencies that together went foomp are now going like foom, 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 foom. It's not a solid punch. It's now like a flump, right? We don't want flump. We want punch. If they're all hitting separately, no matter how you EQ it, it's gonna be, you're going to be hearing those low-mid frequencies that make things so punchy and glorious. They're going to make it sound muddy because they're all hitting over a longer period of time. When everybody hits together, you hear a instant thump, and then you're good. But when they hit spread out because they're all playing at slightly different points in time, it goes thump, and it just makes everything feel more muddy. So no amount of EQ is going to fix that unless you just EQ it to death and then it doesn't have any punch at all, but you got rid of that little flubby muddiness, the mix still doesn't sound good. The only way, the only prayer that you have for big, punchy mixes is if you first have tracks that are in time. Not perfect, but locked in and grooving. So the goal of this video is to give you some advice on how to fix those timing issues, and it's not what you think. I'll get to that in a second, but first a story. Here's my buddy Tim Horsley. If you've taken my recording course, you've spent time with Tim because he plays drums on just about everything that I do. Tim and I have made a lot of music together. We're in a band together called Stare Down. Uh, we... 
which we've released one EP and never played a show, which is just delightful. Uh, but Tim is the real deal. Tim is a fantastic drummer. Tim has been on tour as the drummer for artists like Keith Urban, Gary Allen. I want to say he played with Dina Carter and a bunch of other country acts. He's been on like The Tonight Show. He's played at the CMA Awards, like the TV televised ver- done a lot of really cool stuff. The first time Tim and I worked together, we went to church together, and I wanted to do an album, and I wanted him to play on it because he had a setup at home with his drum. He did home recording. And I, I decided, hey, will you play drums on this project? And he graciously said yes, which is, you know, to this day I'm so thankful for uh, because now we're great friends and we've made a lot of music together. But um, the way that track, that, that process worked, I recorded scratch tracks to the songs. So a scratch track is just a guitar and a vocal to a click. And then I sent him those tracks and he could import those into his system and record his drums and then send me the raw drum files back. Real simple, but honestly not that fun for the drummer because they don't have the full production behind it. They're just recording to a guitar and a vocal. I went over to Tim's house when he was tracking the drums because I wanted to see how he worked. I wanted to just kind of be a fly on the wall, answer any questions he might have. And I noticed when he was setting up his tracks, there were spots where, so I sent him a vocal track and a guitar track. And there were spots on the guitar track in his session he was using, he used a digital performer, where he had sections that looked like this. Uh, like he would go, and it would look something like that. And these were, they were kind of sp- spread throughout the song. I would see these spots. He had already imported the tracks and kind of set things up. So when I arrived, I could see there were spots in the session where the track looked like it might be muted, which is what I did here. And I was thinking to myself, I didn't ask him, but I was thinking, Okay, why would he mute the track there? And the answer I came up with was obvious and painful and uncomfortable. My timing on the guitar was so bad that it was messing up with his timing. Just like that guitar over here made the drums sound out of time, kind of the same thing. So he just, for those sections, and it was typically in a fill section, right, going into a chorus, I would just speed up and get all happy. Um, And I would finally eventually get back on tempo. But he would just mute those sections out where I was out of time. Now, thankfully, later on, I recorded them in time and made it work. But this was this was 12 years ago, 13 years ago. So I was, I'm was i a different guitar player than I was then. And one of the big changes I've made is a concerted effort to play more in the pocket, to play more in time. Uh, honestly, because my goal was to never have Tim have to like mute my drum tracks again. I don't know if I've achieved it. I think I have, but let's talk about that. I want to share four big pieces of advice on how to fix your timing issues. This is I'm thinking about this in terms of rhythm musicians, not so much drummers because I'm not a drummer, but as a guitar player, a keyboard player, how to fix those sloppy timing issues and make things have a whole lot more groove. Number one might seem obvious, but there's a twist. Practice your instrument with a metronome or a drum loop or a drummer if you got one. Now, you might think when you're playing by yourself, you have no reason to believe that you don't have good time. Good time feel, they call it. Uh, Because you're just playing to your own internal clock. And that might sound fine if you're just solo by yourself. But as soon, if you find that when you play with a drummer or a drum loop or anything that has a steady beat to it, and you find... Honestly, this is the way it works for me. You start thinking, man, that is that click speeding up and slowing down? Is that drum loop changing tempo? No, of course not. I'm the one who's got the problem. And that may be the story that you kind of face as well, where you are playing and it's not locking in like you think. And you first think something's wrong out there, but the problem is in here with the way that you're playing and the timing that you have. So it's not enough just to practice with some sort of a metronome. What you got to do, because while you're playing it, you can't really hear the timing issues. The reason you're here and you're having this problem is you don't notice it, or at least you don't notice it till much later. So the key is to record yourself playing to a metronome or a drum track, and then listen back and pay attention to what's going on timing-wise. Ideally, you would do this, you can do this with your phone and just a video, um, but ideally you would record into your DAW and be able to see where things fall on the grid lines. Let me show you. Here are a couple measures of that bad guitar, and as you can see, here's beat two. I am coming in way ahead of the beat. I'm coming in before the beat. The beat's here, I'm coming in early. Same thing here on this beat four, and over here on this beat two, and over here on this beat four. I'm just consistently ahead of the beat. 
that visual feedback, in addition to learning and developing the skill of hearing those timing issues, will allow you to say, okay, I see what's happening. And you may find that you're in time for certain sections of the song, but when you get excited, when you have to sing something, when you go into some sort of a fill or a riff, you'll notice that you speed up. This gives you valuable information to learn your tendencies so you can start to try to correct those. Here's the biggest piece of advice I can give you. I've never done this for just for practice sake. I don't practice this kind of stuff per se. What I do instead is I make music. So I record a bunch of music. So go record a song, record your guitar, set up a drum track, record to it, work on an actual project. And while you're doing it, let's pay attention to the timing stuff and stop everything and go in and listen and check the timing and see how it is and then go back and re-record. If you have to re-record five times, 10 times, 20 times, that's okay as long as you're learning from that and you're improving your time feel with it. It'll be frustrating, but it's totally worth it. Thing number two, target the big beats. This will change from song to song, but in a typical 4-4 song, the two beats that are the biggest priority for me are two and four. <laughs> Two and four. Two and four, which is where the snare hits, and then one and three, which is typically where the kick drum hits. For this specific song, I was hitting my main emphasis were on beats two and four, along with the snare drum, which you can hear like right here. I'm really emphasizing beats two and four. One and three still matter. One being the downbeat is one of the most important things. If you're if you're messing up the downbeat, things have gone awry. But really, those big quarter note beats in a 4-4 song are the, the targets that I'm aiming for. I'm aiming to land on those beats and get those beats right. The stuff that happens in between, the strumming and all of that in-between stuff, that I'm not as worried about. That can actually be pretty loose and even quote-unquote sloppy. But as long as I'm landing back on those beats consistently and on time, everything feels pretty good. So from a guitar standpoint, I'm talking about the big down strum. So if I'm worried about timing and things aren't working really well, I will focus on bringing my hand up a little bit higher than normal and really coming down on the beat. So boom, ba doom, bow, boom, ba doom, bow. And that movement kind of helps me. It's almost like a drummer's hand movement helps me come down right on the beat that I'm aiming for. Thing number three, play behind the beat. Typically, timing issues that you run into are from speeding up, getting ahead of yourself, getting excited, playing ahead of the beat. So when you're thinking about landing on the beat, I'm actually thinking about landing just behind it, just behind the kick drum, just behind the snare. Not way behind, but thinking about if we're like in like a single file line, I want the kick and snare drum to be like the leader of that line, and then everybody else falls in just behind. Not way behind, but just behind. So the first thing my ears hear on that beat is that sharp transient of that drum, and then everything else is kind of right behind it. Funny story, my buddy Tim Horsley was talking about playing on a session, and everybody said, oh man, Tim, you've got such a great pocket. You're playing so behind the beat. It's so groovy. And he kind of laughed and told me I was playing straight on the beat. It was just they were all playing ahead of the beat. They were all rushing, and it made me sound laid back and cool. Laid back and cool. But it was actually them, not me. I thought that was interesting. So my goal when I'm playing is to focus in on what the drums are doing, if there's drums, or just the beat in my head, and playing just just behind that beat. Number four, simpler is better. If you've come to the realization that your stuff doesn't have as good a timing as you would like, a simple solution is to just play simpler parts. A simple, plain, boring part that's in time and grooves is 10 times better than a part with a bunch of cool riffs that's sloppy and out of time. So for a season, Play simpler parts until you develop a better time feel, and then you'll start to be able to play and work in those riffs, but still come down on those beats in time. With that, it's time for me to say goodbye. Get it? If you don't have this checklist, here's another quick reminder. Go grab it, homestudiocorner.com slash checklist. It's free. It's fun. And if you're not subscribed, I've noticed a lot of people watching these videos aren't subscribed. Click over here to subscribe, and YouTube thinks you'll really love this video. Go click on it and find out. See ya.